By the turn of the century, Australia had one of the worst car theft rates in the world. I had a 1997 model Nissan GTR Skyline, a high performance car, it's considered a, a supercar. I stood up quickly and saw what was pretty much the worst thing you could imagine, which was three guys pulling out of the car with balaclavas on. Two had baseball bats and one had an axe. Police came to term the southwest of Sydney a Bermuda Triangle, whereby the thousands cars disappeared. Yeah, vanished into the big black hole somewhere. At the peak of the problem in 2001, over 20,000 cars vanished without trace. One explanation for what was occurring later emerged when a joint police operation exposed an Aladdin's cave of vehicles and parts bound for the Middle East. They know motor vehicles inside out. The knowledge of, of like the shipping overseas, the knowledge of, of the shipping laws and, and um, processes and the whole like. So it is very organised and very sophisticated. Tonight we look at the industry of organised car theft and Middle Eastern crime groups who've captured the largest market share. In the interim, as car theft rates have come down, the amount of vehicles unrecovered has not moved so far. Tonight's program asks why these vehicles continue to vanish in car park proportions. Uh, unfortunately, the, the thieves don't give us their annual return, so we don't really know what's happening. We suspect some of it is being exported. Um, how big that is, we don't really know. Returning from a night out, Iris Anastasu watched a group of men break into her much-loved Toyota. Oh my God, they're taking my vehicle. Someone's actually taking my vehicle. And then all of a sudden I just saw them get in and I went weak on the knees. Paused at a traffic light in Sydney's busy CBD, this woman was threatened with a knife as thieves appeared on both sides of her BMW. And somebody leaned across me, undid my seatbelt. They put their hand on my husband's side who was driving. They put their hand on his ignition so that he couldn't do anything with the key. And they said, get the fuck out of the car. This man had his Mitsubishi Pajero stolen from his driveway while he was sleeping. Early hours on Monday morning, uh, the, the, I got a call from the police and they told me they recovered the car and it had been destroyed by fire. The three victims had something further in common. Parts of their vehicles were later discovered in shipping containers after customs officials grew suspicious. There seemed to be uh, a lot of uh, exports of car parts to the Middle East, uh, which is not really a, uh, a normal exportation. Uh, the, the volumes just seemed excessive. Uh, there were other sort of indicators which um, looked a bit strange as well. Led by New South Wales Police, a joint operation was begun. For six months, police watched two groups operating from these premises. One was led by this man, George El Far, who had earlier come to notice. Elfar was said to be the brains behind a multi-million dollar car stealing racket operating in Sydney South West. Police claimed he paid car thieves to steal 200 late model vehicles. They were then cut up for parts or reassembled. Having fled Australia while on bail, Elfar carried on business as usual from his home country, Jordan. Telephone intercepts revealed him directing the operation of stealing cars to order. Using transcripts of evidence, we've reproduced conversations using the voices of actors. Here, an associate speaks with Elfar's son, Andrew. Andrew, I spoke to your dad today about the murder. Yeah? My mate just rang me now. He said he can get one. I 
It's going to be six cylinders, but it's going to be fucking white or silver colored. White or silver only? Yeah. He's saying he's finding it very difficult to find the green color. He reckons that they are old models. You rarely find any. Because I spoke to your dad today and he said, please make sure it is six and please make sure the color is green. Some of it was ad hoc. Um, a car thief would have a car and present and say, do you want it? But there was also evidence that it was to order a specific type of car, had a specific colour, model, year make. So some of it was very, very specific. My name is Bruno Hassan. I own this baby here. That's an 03 that we reached in prison. The other syndicate was also a family enterprise, a key figure, as it happens, a star of the show car scene. It was Brian that brought out Mr. CRX. He's In the modified car world, Brian L. Hassan went on to become known as Mr. WRX. L. Hassan and his cars frequently appearing in magazines and specialist videos. You're looking at a set of $10,000 rims. You're looking at $200,000 car. El Hassan was at home in a community deeply attached to its cars, but it should be said a flash car or a Middle Eastern background does not a criminal make. Oh, I've always loved lions. I've got a thing about lions. I've got a lot of pictures of lions at home. Oh, you can't put a price on something like this because you just got to enjoy it. That's basically about it. If you're going to count the money, it's not worth. It's not worth really going into it. The wheels, I just purchased them uh, two days ago. They're from Aussie Tyres. Um, first, first car in Australia to have these wheels on it. And it's a labour of love, is it? Oh, yes. <laughs> I, I work for my car, yeah. I don't, I don't shop for anything other than car shopping. So. With the help of his brothers, Brian L. Hassan ran MC Racing from a small garage in Bankstown. From one of the crime syndicates who was set up a, a registered business and everything, we found no evidence of legitimacy. The other one, there, there was some efforts of legitimacy, albeit in a very small and ad hoc way, and it really had no bearing on what they were doing in the illegitimate world. In one of hundreds of intercepts delivered as court evidence, Brian L. Hassan gave a clue to how he might have been paying for his expensive hobby, appearing to offer a stolen engine for sale. It's a stand, but it has been passed through the police. The one that was in my other one. He wants it, but he wants to change it. You know what I'm talking about? He wants one hot? Yeah, yeah, he doesn't care. Yes, I do have a hot one, but I only have the block in the head. The injection I have removed. Traditionally, car theft's been extremely easy in this country to the point in around about the late 90s we had the second highest rate of car theft in the Western industrial world. Um, professional car theft particular, in particular is extremely easy to, um, to change a vehicle's identity, launder it through the registration system of any state or territory and then sell it to an unsuspecting buyer. Evidence collected from the El Hassan premises spoke of a major rebirthing racket. At this stage in 2001-2002, when theft rates had soared to 145,000 cars, rebirthing was ridiculously easy. There are a number of ways. If, if this is, is the stolen vehicle, then the first thing you need to do is to put an engine with the correct identification number. So you'll take an engine from another donor car, it could be an accident damaged car, it could be another car that you get from, uh, from another source, uh, and so that, the, so that the, uh, uh, the engine number matches the VIN, and then you'll have to modify this VIN. So um, it's not terribly rocket science. It can either have the metal cut out and a new piece welded in with the identifier of the donor car, and the compliance plates and the build plates are really very low technology. They're just...